Hello plant people, how are you guys doing today? If you're new around here, my name is Ashley and I'm a soil scientist on this channel. I like to take that science and apply it to all things plants. And so if you like the sounds a lot, be sure to hit that subscribe button down below and join this miraculously awesome crew. And in today's video, we're talking all about charcoal and exactly what the properties behind it, its uses, and actually debunking a surprising amount of myths that come with charcoal and some actual dangers of using charcoal in your potted plants. Now, if you are a gardener or you are thinking of using a biochar in an indoor setting, I can't actually do a video where I say that they're the same thing because in my mind as a soil scientist I actually treat them very differently and the number one reason for the different treatment actually stems from the fact that biochar has varying levels of surface area and varying levels of porosity which actually has a huge effect on how it performs from a chemical level all the way to a physical level in the soil, whether that be in a gardening setting or in your pots. So I do have to do biochar as a separate video. If you would like more on biochar, please let me know in the comments down below and I will make sure to do that for you. As you guys probably have already guessed, this is a part of the wonderful soil amendment series. And so far we've done everything from pure light, vermiculite, uh, I think we've done peat moss, coconut choir, just n nearly anything you could possibly add to the soil. And I am still looking for more ideas. And none of these ideas go unheard because, for example, charcoal was a requested amendment that several of you asked for. So I present to you the soil scientist's opinion on something that is essentially claimed to be a miracle product. I was absolutely blown away by some of the remarks when it came to this. So if you guys don't know, in these videos, the way that I research or the way that I put them together is I actually start off with the claims and kind of what blogger gardeners or blogger plant people say about the product and some of the claims they make, some of the ideas that they have, some of the things that they've seen. So I use those first-hand accounts to kind of set the premise or uh, get an idea of what maybe you guys are seeing either on YouTube or on the internet. From there, I obviously write my arguments down for or against what these bloggers or YouTubers or influencers are seeing in regards to the product. And then I take what I think is a reality and I print off a bunch of different PDFs. I put them onto my tablet that are different scientific journals and research that scientists, soil scientists have done in regards to charcoal, for example, in this case. And then I read through the studies and I find commonalities in the studies. So I look for a message that is loud and clear that shows for or against the product. Now I do leave out the outliers and I leave out the big ta-da moments in the scientific journals, mostly because I find that if one study has been able to do it, I need multiple studies that are able to replicate it before I'm going to tell you guys that it's a miracle in any sense or it's able to do a certain thing. So I'm looking for repetition when I'm sorting through these journals. And let me tell you, charcoal took me on a deep dive I did not expect to find. So when I was researching on the blogger side, I had claims everywhere from adding porosity, adding nutrients, detoxifying the soil, removing pesticides from the soil, um, bigger, better plants, you name it. It was listed when it came to charcoal being used in a potting system. When I transferred over to the scientific journals, a lot of the claims I thought at the time, you know, there was some sense to it, but there were things that I obviously were, there were alarm bells for me. One was 
its ability to retain water but also drain right off the bat I knew because it was a burnt charcoal is a burnt wood essentially I knew it would be hydrophobic to a point so it's not going to be good at retaining water and there's a few other arguments right off the bat that I knew were probably not true and they weren't seeing those effects and they would be charcoal would be to their detriment further on or they simply just didn't add enough charcoal to see any real reality or any real effects of charcoal in the soil when i dived into the literature scientific literature on this stuff it was all over the map i'm not gonna lie um it was everywhere from it's a miracle product it works really great in some cases to it is not the greatest solution for plants and so that made it a little bit more difficult for me to kind of place on the spectrum what this will do for you so i'm gonna go through each element and um, you're gonna hear me say that it's good for this and it's really bad for that. And I'm going to leave it up to you guys to decide and discuss in the comments below what you think. If you think it is beneficial or it's not, it's got some really great properties to it. Um, and it doesn't have some great properties to it. I personally have never used it. And the reason why I didn't use it, I will put at the end of this video, but it is completely from personal experience. Back 15 years ago, um, my first experience with activated charcoal in particular, which we will get into the differences of that, differences of that, but why I've completely steered away from it from that day. So let's just hop into it. I apologize in advance for any mass confusion I may cause about charcoal, but it's a thick, thick substance, a thick topic. And I think because it's such a new product that not a lot of people have spoken about charcoal in any sense. And uh, not a lot of research actually has been done on it. A lot of research has been done on biochar because that is more for agriculture and food production. But when it comes to house plants, there's not a lot on charcoal. But so what exactly is charcoal? It is essentially burnt wood. That's all it is. Now, there's varying levels of charcoal. There's just regular charcoal, which is non-activated. It looks like wood chips. That is what you see when you see orchid medium mixed charcoal. It is the roughed out, just essentially burnt and chopped up wood. That is level one when it comes to charcoal. When I talk about this charcoal, it has properties that are less intense than every type of charcoal going up the spectrum. The second type is activated charcoal. So this is also burnt wood, burnt organic material that has then been manufactured or in some way altered to increase the porosity and essentially the surface area of the actual product itself. Meaning it has uh, properties that are more magnetizing for lack of a better term here, allows for certain chemical altering properties within the soil, which we will get into a little bit later. And then the next level up would be super activated charcoal, which again is just another step up when it comes to surface area, amount of porosity in the product. So as always, because it is a soil amendment and this is a soil amendment series, we're gonna be looking at cation exchange capacity in particular, pH, which is very interesting when it comes to charcoal. And then lastly, the porosity and the porosity rating is my own rating because there really is no way to give a porosity rating as I've spoken about before to a product that is on its own without it being in a unit. So I'm going to be talking about charcoal in a potting soil type scenario. I will not be telling you how much of this stuff to add. There is no such thing as a special recipe for soil, regardless of the soil amendment, regardless of who is telling you what that recipe is. It is a myth. It completely depends on where you're located in the world, whether you're in a zone three, even for houseplants, it matters, or if you're in a zone 10, how much sunlight those plants are getting, what kind of pot the plants are in, how big the plant is, what type of plant it is, 
it, there's so many factors when it comes to potting soil. So there is no magic recipe. I will not give you a magic recipe. I do not believe in it. I want to give you guys the tools to make something that works for your climate. End of story. So what are we talking about when we're talking about activated? What does that mean? And this is seemingly hotly debated when it came to the literature that I read. It essentially means the ability for that carbon product to be able to soak up or retain toxins. And I have a problem with that when you're talking about plants. Charcoal is, I'm not arguing that char charcoal is not great at removing toxins. If you ever talk to a nurse when it comes to pumping stomachs, when it comes to a drug overdose or an alcohol overdose, I'm pretty sure they use charcoal. If you're a nurse or a doctor, please let me know in the comments below, but I'm pretty confident that activated charcoal is what they use. The stuff is really good at pulling toxins out, but I think it is important to note that what's toxic to a human, and when we're talking about human anatomy, it doesn't necessarily transfer over into plants. And so while charcoal does pull toxins out of the soil, it also pulls out nutrients because it's not a sentient being. It does not know what is good and what is bad. It is completely dependent on the charge of the molecule it is grabbing. And so if a toxin has the same molecule as ammonium or nitrite or nitrite, it is also going to suck up the ammonium, the nitrate, the nitrite, uh, phosphate, whatever. It will suck up nutrients and it will suck up much needed metals that plants do need to survive out of the soil profile and into the charcoal itself. So it is a sponge that is judge, jury, and executioner on all things <laughs> nutrient and toxin. There is no uh, filter that differentiates between the two. And I think that is an important thing to remember. Now, while it does suck up toxins and nutrients, I will continue to repeat that because it's just, it's an important thing to remember. It is only active, and this is again, it's debated, but it is estimated from two to four weeks in a system. Meaning, if you are using it solely to be able to pull toxins out of your soil, say pesticide, for example, then you would have to refresh that charcoal in your soil every two to four days. If you're using it to reduce the smell of your soil, which if your soil smells rancid and it doesn't smell earthy, which is a very normal smell, if it smells rancid, you need to just change your soil in general. It probably indicates you have some sort of rot, but if you're using it for any of those methods, you do have to replace it every two to four days. There's also no real literature talking about exactly how much charcoal you have to add to a system to get any detoxifying effects. So. I couldn't tell you if one gram of charcoal for every 10 grams of soil would result in this much nutrients being removed from your soil or if more nutrients would be removed or if there's a barrier eventually you hit for nutrient removal. I don't know. There's literally, there's nothing I could find that said there's a threshold that you can hit where it's safe and your soil nutrient is okay or there's a threshold that you may hit where your soil nutrient would eventually be completely absorbed by the charcoal and removed. There's just, there's nothing that says that. So I can't tell you what the threshold between danger and not danger is. What I can say is that if you're running into signs of nutrient deficiency and you have charcoal in your soil, as long as the charcoal isn't over 50% of your soil, I would think you'd probably want to look for a different avenue when it came to the reasoning behind the nutrient deficiency. I doubt that charcoal would be the reason for it. Now, if you had it in a solely charcoal system, then no, like obviously you need to change that. But if it was mixed in with a soil, I would think the threshold would be actually relatively pretty high. So this is the part about charcoal that really scares me about people using this in their planting systems and it's actually the ph of the product so it is very very alkaline most studies that i looked at showed a ph of 12 to 13 
And if you've been on this channel long enough, you know that this sweet spot for a lot of gardeners is between six and seven. Plant parents in general, indoor plants, outdoor plants, six to seven. And we know this because pH is completely relative to exactly how much nutrients is available to the plant. So if we get out of that range, what ends up happening is we end up with nutrient issues. We end up with nutrient deficiencies. And because that pH is so high, when it's added to soil, it most definitely will have an effect on the overall soil pH in general. That goes without saying. Because your natural pH of, say, a peat based soil with some organic material in it, it's probably in and around that, you know, five to seven mark. I doubt it's lower and I doubt it's higher. Once you add charcoal in, what ends up happening is it's going to climb. And one account that I did read about said that his pH was, don't want to screw this up. He said his pH starting out was a 6.5. When he added the charcoal to his soil, it spiked to an eight. So that eight pH will result in something called chlorosis. Because the pH is so high, a lot of nutrients are going to be tightly bound to the soil and not available to the plant to take up. And it's going to result in basically something that looks like this. And so, he actually had to completely redo all his plants because of that result. So something very important to note, because pH is related to the cation exchange capacity, which I told you we'd talk about, it's also important to note that the cation exchange capacity and the toxin absorbing abilities go up as pH rises, which we know this because we've talked about porosity and we've talked about cation exchange capacity and its effect on soil before. So as our pH rises, our cation exchange capacity goes up. As our cation exchange capacity goes up, that means that our product is actually holding on to more and more nutrients. It's getting tighter and tighter bound to the actual amendment, meaning it's not available for plants. Because it's naturally at this 12 to 13 range, it on its own has a cation exchange capacity that is completely not plant habitable. So if you were to plant a plant in straight charcoal, you, it would die, it would die. There's no way it could survive. Unless it's an absolute extremophile, it could not survive. One study I did find that looked at the pH of the charcoal and then actually measured the cation exchange capacity of the charcoal at those varying rates showed a drastic spike and I'll pop that study, the figure from that study up here. The cation exchange capacity absolutely spiked at six. Meaning if you have charcoal in your system in a capacity that hasn't altered your pH hugely, and you have a pH of your soil is still at a very reasonable six to seven, which is what plants like, you still have a milli equivalent per 100 grams, a cation exchange capacity that is so high, and I can't, I didn't write it down on my notes because I just found it just before I started filming this video, but I believe it was over 200 milli equivalents per 100 grams right around that six pH level. So right in the wheelhouse of where you need to be, those milli equivalents are already so high. So it's capturing a lot of nutrients and toxins out of the soil profile and therefore not leaching it out <laughs> and keep keeping it away from the actual plant itself. Which brings me to my next point whether it be biochar or charcoal if someone has ever and i know someone's done it on this group i think i've done it actually if you take biochar and you put it on your soil everything will die around that soil area and it's a combination of all these factors coming into play 
And so if you add too much charcoal to your soil, you will, in a house plant scenario, in an outdoor plant scenario, you will show signs of nutrient deficiency and you may kill your plant. That's what makes this product so much different than something like Pure Light or Vermiculite. There is a balance and there is such a thing as too much. With Vermiculite, Perlite, even wood chips that aren't charcoal, I would never say don't watch how much you put in. I would say experiment, try different varying levels of each because those ones are safe, but this isn't. So you do need to use some caution when using charcoal in any sort of system. So porosity, and this is my last and probably one of the most unique and favorite parts about charcoal. There was one claim on a influencer's site that said it's really great at holding water, but also adding to the overall drainage of the pot. And I initially right away thought to myself, well, it's a burnt product, meaning it's naturally very hydrophobic. And so I dove into the literature and that's exactly what it said. It is hydrophobic, naturally very hydrophobic. However, if we look at charcoal under a microscope, we'll notice that it's very flat on the outside, but it has all these little pores on kind of the outside. What charcoal does is if you were to put it in water, while it in its totality is hydrophobic, over time those pores naturally just through gravity and capillary action would slowly fill with water and it would sink the charcoal, meaning it can hold water if it's been under saturation for long periods of time. And then if you were to let it dry out due to capillary forces, anti-gravitational forces, it would stay retained in that carbon product, which would then eventually be available to the plants. However, the outside of the charcoal itself due to its naturally hydrophobic ways would actually add to drainage. So, so long as it wasn't in a saturated system, it would allow water to flow out of the system a lot easier. However, under saturation, it would fill up with water and then provide almost like a sink for the plants later on. So that is very interesting. I want you to think of it as a ship. So you have a wooden ship. <laughs> if you were to poke a hole in the side of the ship, it would float for a while but eventually it would fill for with water and it would sink. Charcoal is the exact same way. So while we have extreme pHs, while we have this obnoxiously high cation exchange capacity, which can take nutrients out of your soil, it does provide a way to drain your soil or um, allow for less water retention in the soil profile itself. Meaning, if it's used in any sort of capacity responsibly and you're not seeing nutrient deficiency issues, if you're testing the, your pH with your soil, with your probe, it actually may be beneficial if you are an overwaterer, especially. With that also being said, I did say earlier in the video that it needs to be replaced every two to four weeks if you're using it for anti-toxin or anti-smell reasons, which means it's like a sponge. Eventually it fills up and then it can't take on any more. And that's because of that really high cation exchange capacity, it doesn't have the ability to let go of the toxins once it fills up which leads me to believe that if you were able to get through the first four weeks, say, without any sort of nutrient deficiency showing up, with any chlorosis happening, you may be past the point where that obnoxious cation exchange capacity is going to affect the ability for your plant to capture nutrients. And so long as you're testing your pH 
and your pH isn't obnoxiously high due to the natural pH of the charcoal and you're able to have your soil in its entirety sit around that really nice six or seven, then charcoal would be beneficial because it would allow for drainage at an adequate pH without the detrimental cation exchange capacity. That's where I'm at, I'm sorry. I can't say it's bad and I can't say it's good. What I can say is that within the first month, if you're noticing your plants are going into a downward spiral after adding charcoal to your soil, the pH and the cation exchange capacity, its ability to absorb may be the reason why you're seeing that. But if you're able to supplement with fertilizer or whatever the case is and get it past that hump and neutralize your pH, eventually, then it may work when it comes to adding porosity and actually making a better draining soil. The verdict's out. Do you use, use charcoal? Let me know in the comments below. Did you notice any of these things? I actually kind of just want to go get a bag of charcoal for the sole purpose <laughs> of seeing what it does in my soil system and kind of what that threshold is. However, I don't really want to kill any of my plants, so I probably will wait till the spring and I'll try it on some seedlings um, that I'm not too fond of. I don't want to do it with any of my tropicals because that would make me sad. What I will say, and the reason why I decided to not use charcoal years ago was because I told you when I was talking about how to responsibly start a plant collection, I referred to my experience at Petland and how I started off with aquarium plants. That was actually where the whole plant obsession started for me. And one of the things that you learned right off the bat when I was 15 years old, when it came to aquarium plants, is that prolonged use of charcoal in an aquarium setting for a planted aquarium is actually a major detriment to the growth of your plants. Because if you're adding any sort of artificial fertilizer to your uh, aquatic systems, the charcoal would naturally remove that those fertilizers from your soil or from your fish tank and would eventually decrease the growing rates of your aquatic plants. So that was my first experience with charcoal. Now that was if it was for prolonged use and you were actually regularly changing this stuff every you know two to four weeks. I think it was once a month at the time with the filter and the brand that I was using. And so that was my experience. Now, when I went to university, I learned a little bit more about this stuff. Again, right away, it told me activated charcoal in particular, not great for a soil system. Um, and there were, you know, a lot of uh, arguments against actual biochar um, in a system in excess. So that's my experience. I hope this didn't confuse you greatly. I hope it actually helped you a little bit, help you make a little bit more of an informed decision about charcoal. I don't think it's the end all be all. If you're spending big bucks on this stuff, don't, because I, just, I don't think it's worth it. I think you could definitely try a more coarse perlite and it's going to function a lot better than a charcoal would. And there's a lot of other products that we're gonna get to eventually in this series that are a lot better than charcoal. I think it's a fad right now. And it's a fad because, yeah, it's just, I don't know. I don't know, I don't know what to think. People are going crazy for it though. I don't know why. From the research I've seen, it's uh, less than ideal. I wanna thank you guys so much for watching. Be sure to hit that subscribe button, give this video a thumbs up, and I will talk to you guys next time. Bye.